Hi, I'm Graham Glynn, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching, Learning plus Technology at Stony Brook University. And this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices to teaching and applications of educational technology that have a positive effect on student learning. In today's show, I'm joined by Dr. Tom Hemmick, Distinguished Teaching Professor at Stony Brook in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. We'll be discussing how to keep students engaged in large lecture classes. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Graham. So tell me a little bit about the classes you teach and the venue in which you teach them. Mostly I've been teaching the introductory physics courses, whether they're for physics majors and engineers or they're for life science students. And as a result of that, the class sizes are often very large. Typically I'm teaching between 200 to 700 students. Um, and in this case, the biggest challenge is, of course, keeping the attention of a very large number of students during a lecture. Okay. So my understanding is you're a big proponent of the lecture method of delivering courses. Tell me why you think that's an effective approach. I like the lecture because the lecture is somehow personal. Um, what I find is that as I'm teaching, the first thing I need to do is have the student's attention. And in order to have the attention, I need to maintain the attention. I have several tricks. But in particular, you need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. So as you're teaching a class, if you're just back and looking at there's what I've written and isn't it interesting, you're not interested in neither are they. Right. But in fact, as you turn to a lecture class, in the process of simply monitoring whether they're paying attention, you meet the student's eyes. Mm -hmm. And in that process, not only do you find out whether they're paying attention, but also you make the experience very personal. And even in a very large lecture hall, you can, while looking across the students, catch many eyes during the lecture. And in this case, it can become sort of intimate and one-to-one, -one despite the size of the class. Okay. And you feel that, that eye contact is enough to keep attention? Not always. Um, occasionally, you actually have to turn it into a small weapon. Okay. Because as you're looking across the classroom, you'll spot someone. And they're looking down or away or up or somewhere else. And in this case, what you can do is you can lecture right to them, straight into their averted eyes. Mm -hmm. And then, at some point, their glance will meet yours. <laughs> he sees me. Okay. And at that moment, a student will be immediately brought back to lecture. Okay. And um, so for a while, you can tend to maintain the attention through this kind of a little trick. Well, more overall, actually the fact that you're interested in the topic makes you interesting. Mm -hmm. And every professor has an advantage in this because they're teaching what they love, and so it is interesting to them. And you continue to communicate that and make eye contact. But over time, eventually you won't be able to keep up with the number of students whose eyes are averted. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find some other way to do things. So when the tone of your voice and louds and softs and pause and looking at students give up, you have to find some other way to make an abrupt change. An abrupt change that suddenly, no matter whether you're paying attention or not, someone, what's that? What's going on? Something's different. Uh, and so for me, what, what I love to do is tell stories. Okay. And so, um, uh, just through my life and also through watching things and noticing, wow, this is a good story. Because, you know, when things go bad, first there's bad, then there's bad enough to be a good story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can spend your life collecting these things up. And so, for example, I'll give a lecture in which I explain the velocity of sound formula. And in this lecture, you need to understand that sound waves are caused by an adiabatic expansion and contraction of the gas because there's no source of heat and then you derive and you derive and you derive and you come up with a formula. And so my story for that, when that gets to be boring and that gets to be boring sometimes, is to tell students that, you know what, when I was a freshman, I was at a community campus just like yours and I made the freshman blunder. Okay. I took an 820 class Tuesday and Thursday despite the fact that I had a 30 minute commute. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was terrible. So don't worry. I spent Monday night and Wednesday night at my grandmother's house, who lived two miles from the university. And each night I would come home and I would tell her 
what I had done in physics. And she wasn't trained in physics, and so she would ask a few questions, but then one night, we've been studying sound. And so she said, ah, you've been studying sound. Yes. Well, in that case, if on Saturday evening the furnace in the church breaks and on Sunday morning it's extremely cold, is the pipe organ sharp or flat? Well, I thought about it, and I put on my usual distinguished air of a know-it-all and explained to her that because the temperature is lower, the pipes will shrink, and because the pipes are shorter, the frequency will be higher, and so the pipe organ is sharp. So she looked me in the eye and she said, the pipe organ is flat. I don't know why, but when you do, then you will have learned something. Mm -hmm. And so when I just break up the lecture with that sort of a story coming in, then students are able to relax for a moment and get themselves focused and say, hey, you know, that's in there. And then the reason that story is so important is you can explain why I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that the velocity of sound formula that we w just arrived had a square root of temperature in the numerator. And the low temperature caused the velocity of sound to drop that's why the pipe organ frequency is low. Okay. And that's what we just got in our formula. So, and if, if that isn't enough, then that same formula has the mass of the gas, which is normally nitrogen. But of course, if you replace it with helium by breathing it out of a balloon, a balloon, you can then explain to them in a Donald Duck voice exactly why the rest of this formula is also important. Okay. So, just little things like this that as you monitor the class, you notice that the attention is failing, you find a way to personalize it, bring it back, change, and really make a break in the pace and the tone just to bring people's eyes back to you so that you're an interesting enough to follow for the rest of the hour. Do you use humor as one of those tools? Oh, sure. Um, anytime I can come up with something humorous, um, uh, I love to. Um, and the interesting thing is, I'm not all that funny. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you've probably heard the phrase nervous laugh. Yep. And that is when two people are nervous. with <laughs> Everything is leaving you on the edge of laughing. Mm -hmm. Well, what better situation is there than a group of students watching a lecture? Every one of them is slightly nervous because the material is difficult and they need to learn it because they need to get a grade. And if the professor cracks some joke, any joke, no matter how lame, it's funny in that context. So students have actually noticed. I've been using the Echo 360. It's not funny when I watch it in the recording, but it was funny while I was there. And uh, so you don't need to be afraid if you're a lecturer to try a little bit of humor because people are ready to laugh. Now, you're a natural performer. What about a faculty member who isn't? How could they go about improving their skills and be a better performer in front of the audience? Well, um, performer is a, a good choice of words. Um, what I find is that if you have any sort of training, whether formal or informal, in some sort of a performing art, mm -hmm. that this will serve you very well. It could be theater. It could be music. In my case, um, I'm not a professional musician, but I've had the uh, joy of being directed in university choirs and things like that by really good musicians. And so uh, this level of uh, training actually comes through in subtle ways that you wouldn't imagine. I once gave a lecture, and another faculty member was there. And then later on, he came to the university chorale performance. And I was there also. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I should have known by the way you enunciated in your lecture uh -huh. that you sang. And I never connected it. Wow, there is a need to communicate. Now, what you're communicating is music and emotion, but it's a need to communicate. And and all you can understand your words, because you don't enunciate, no one can understand your words, mm -hmm. it's not effective. And so these things tend to carry over. And also, you know, if you perform in front of an audience here and there, then uh, you get to be relaxed in front of a group of students. Sure. What about physical presence? Uh, physical presence, uh, I uh, guess I... For example, I, I notice a lot of faculty who will pace back and forward over the same three feet when they are addressing an audience. They just sort of... And that, yeah, I sort, of really of, I sort of move around among the, the more or less same 30 by 30 feet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I like to move. I like to use my hands. You know, I can hardly keep them still here now. And um, that's especially important in a large lecture hall. 